Okay, some housekeeping stuff. So we've got quiz six due this Friday by 11.59 p.m., right? Everybody on board with that? So the purpose of the, the chapter quizzes is to make sure that you're being held accountable for the content in the textbook. It's going to be a little bit more comprehensive, touching on some stuff that we don't touch. It's intentional, okay? Broad-based. Today, you're going to have a take-home assignment for a bonus opportunity. You're going to be reading a paper out of the literature on wound healing. So very different than what we typically do in this class. But they're bonus points. They don't count against you. They're for exam two. 14 possible points. Yeah. 14 possible points on the bonus. So stick, stick to the end. You're going to read the primary literature. You're going to have some questions on Canvas that you have to answer based upon the paper that you read. Okay, this is, yeah, this is a little bit more challenging than what we, we typically do. But, you know, if, you want to, if I push you and you're willing to do it, you get some bonus opportunity for it. How does the bonus work? Can somebody explain it to us? How do we use the bonus? Use add, the the add the points to the test score on Monday, and that's your total exam two test score. You with me? We'll drop the lowest of your tests. That also means we drop the bonus as well. We'll drop the lowest total exam score out of five. So if the last exam was just something you don't want to remember, we can make that happen. Done. If you still want to see your exam, probably not a bad idea. I had a lot of students in today. I could be here tomorrow um, if, you, if you want to schedule a time. I could be here Friday if you want to schedule a time. See your exam packet. Just kind of see what you missed, what happened. Okay. Exam two is on Monday in this room. Same time, same location, same everything. The difference is we're going to have someone stationed up here to help make sure they go into the right pile. Okay, that was a little bit of a miscue on us, so we'll fix that. Correction on something I said that one of you actually corrected me on, and, and uh, Elena was so kind to, to point out my humanness as well. So osteoblasts are not mitotic, and I misspoke. They are highly metabolic, but they're not highly mitotic. So they're very active, but they don't divide. So I got those words mixed up. So that's a correction. Three remaining review session, sessions. Do you all see this posted? And the Zoom links are posted as well. I saw that go out today. So just to repeat, Thursday, tomorrow, 4 to 5 in person, Science Annex 122. Uh, Friday, 1 to 2 by Zoom. And then Sunday, Bio 256 in person, 1 to 2 p.m. Five participation points available just attend one of the four. There was one this afternoon that you had to be on kind of early and on front of it. But we had how many? 20-some today? So that's great. You're studying early. Uh, any questions on exam two? Monday. Yeah, so the question is, What's the format of the exam? It's going to be very similar to the last exam. You'll have five questions on the screen. Uh, a lot of students that I talked to had a lot of anxiety during the exam. Like, golly, it's just a lot happening. It's a big room. You should have plenty of time. Okay? At the end, at an hour and 15 mark, there were like three people in here. You know, and people start leaving in 30 minutes. I, I get that. But it also means if you left in 30 minutes, you could have taken the test twice and double-checked your answers. And the statistic, t statistics demonstrate to me that the people that turn it in the first don't necessarily do the best. 
okay? So, and I'm not trying to call anybody out on that, but for some of you that are like all anxious, like they're already done, and I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know this as well. Well, maybe you know it better, actually. And, and test management, take the time. 35, 40 minutes into the exam, you know, there's like 35 plus minutes remaining. You could come sit anywhere. Or you can move. You just raise your hand. Can, can I move? Can I, can I get closer to the screen? It'd be nice to see. You know, I think these screens are actually better quality on the sides than the one that's projecting in the middle. So it's actually nice that we had those added. Last year, they didn't have those. So if you want to see that screen and, you know, sit like right here and be able to look right at it, no problem. We'll work with you. Raise your hand. Here's a lot of you. We'll try to make our way around the room to maybe clarify a question. Like whatever we can do to lower the anxiety, you should, you should have plenty of time to take the test if you're studying, okay? There's study guides, cahoots, review sessions. You'll have about 10% review style questions over unit one. Big concepts, like things about diffusion and osmosis. Like what are those? Um, bigger concepts like, you know, what happens if ATP is not available. So one of you was in my office and we were talking about this question. So if, if you had, a, remember the question on exam one, there's a poison that, that blocks ATP, what happens? Right, and, and one of your colleagues was like, yeah, first I was freaking out like, I don't know anything about poisons. <laughs> well, the question's really not about poison. If you read, I'm actually just trying to make sure you're not just memorizing stuff and you actually can think. Right, so if a poison blocks ATP, what's, what's not gonna happen? Do you guys remember that question? Tell me, what's not gonna happen if ATP is not available? How about diffusion? How about osmosis? Are they gonna still happen? Do they require ATP? So if there's a poison, good news, osmosis and diffusion still happen. What about an ATP requiring process like what? Like active transport. That was, the, that was the test question. You remember that? So it's not just a question of like what is active transport. It's actually trying to apply the information. So some of the questions are like second level questions. They are a little bit more difficult in a 200 level course. It's not a 100 level course. We're trying to make you think. But those are the kinds of applications that you're going to have in the future. And then someone asked, you're sitting back there now, you used to sit over there, can you get more than 100% on exam two? Well, yeah, you can. If there's 14 bonus opportunities available, yeah, you could pretty much kill the exam if you really focused. Right? And you did so-so on exam one, you really do well on exam two, maybe you save your drop for the final. Right? If, if exam one is like not salvageable, then fine, you're going to have to take the final, right? It's more of like a last exam than a final. It's like a unit five with review, okay? Does that answer your question? All right. Anything else? Yep. Yeah, like Clarifying question. The final exam is more of like exam five. So it's one of the exams that could be dropped. Yes. So if you do really well all semester... My gift to you, Christmas in May, is you don't have to take the final. You drop the final. Focus on your other tough classes. It's all in the syllabus, right? This shouldn't be a surprise, but yeah. Sometimes you have, I know, you have four syllabi that you've read, and you can't remember which one goes to which. So yeah, ask these questions. I don't mind. But yeah, that's how that's interpreted. The last exam is a final, but it is an exam five. It is eligible to be dropped. So if you kick... But all semester, you don't have to do the final. Fine, no problem. Good? Okay. What did the mom chameleon say to her nervous kid on the first day of school? Try and blend in? Yeah, don't worry. You'll blend right in. Like it. Pretend, all right, everyone close your eyes. Pretend you're in the jungle and a tiger is chasing you. What do you do? Stop pretending and open your eyes, right? All right, good job. 
What do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator. Boom, boom. All right. We're getting funnier, or you guys are just wearing down. One of the two. All right, last part, skeletal system. This is game on for Monday's exam. This is the last material. <clears throat> Hopefully, you watch the online lecture on Monday. So you're caught up. And um, <clears throat> we're going to pick it right up from that. If you aren't, this section is actually relatively independent of the first two lectures in this segment. All right, this one's talking a lot more about diseases, um, etiologies, uh, epidemiology, kind of health-related stuff. Some of you actually might find this way more interesting and way easier material to digest because you're like, okay, yeah, I'm super interested in disease, how it impacts my future patients, what to do about it, you know, why we advocate certain things. My clicker's not working. There we go. So let's start out first with a disease known as osteoporosis. True or false? Osteoporosis only affects women. False. That is absolutely false. Osteoporosis is a disease that characterizes a loss of bone mass a loss of a lot of cancellous tissue. It is more commonly found in elderly women, but it is a misunderstanding, generally, that it's a woman's disease. That is not true. The, the reason that women are at higher risk is because of the onset of menopause, where somewhere between the age of 45 and 55, plus or minus, women tend to drop their production of estrogen quickly, like immediately. And that stops the menstrual cycle. Now they're no longer of childbearing age. Uh, they won't ovulate. There won't be a fertilization event. And they no longer have the same amount of estrogen that they once were used to. Causes a lot of problems, okay? Some women more aggressively than in others in menopause. And <clears throat> One of the onsets is this huge, dramatic risk associated with bone loss and bone density and bone mass because estrogen has a bone protective characteristic to it. And so we look at a lot of different things about prevention that we're going to talk about, and then we actually have some pharmaceutical treatments for patients in menopause. But you can see on this lower left picture that we, we oh, wow. I almost hung myself on that. We got, we got um, a bone density scan of normal bone on the very lower left, and then just to the right of it, osteoporotic bone that actually you can hopefully appreciate the loss of density or loss of mass. If we look at the spinal column, this happens all over the body. It's happening in the femoral heads at the hip. It's happening in the arms. It's happening... Long bones, short bones, irregular bones, um, irregular bones of the vertebrae, now you're going to start getting a lot of compression that's taking place. And so you start seeing some of the remodeling with exaggerated thoracic kyphotic angles, right? So the, the, the thoracic region, if you're looking from the posterior aspect, is curved like this. It's convex. So in elderly individuals, this happens in men too, at a slightly older age, but in, in postmenopausal women, you'll start seeing kind of that hunchback where that kyphotic angle is really starting to exaggerate because you're getting a lot of pressure here from the uh, head uh, and upper arms that are putting pressure on that vertebral column and the density is, is dropping. And so the support as the bone remodels is less and less and less. So they're more at risk of fractures if they have a fall. And that's why we worry about elderly slipping and falling and breaking something. Now, in the elderly, you know, your center of mass, and then we'll get to your question, is really located around your pelvic girdle, 
right? That's like, you know, if, if any of you were like wrestlers or MMA or you grapple or anything like that, or even in football players, right? You want to control your opponent, you control their hips. So when you fall, one of the first thing that's going to happen if you can't catch yourself is your hips going to hit the ground, right? Question. So good question. In elderly, elderly individuals where they say, I'm shorter, I'm, I'm, I've lost height, is that exclusively because of the hunch? No, it happens all over the place. But what's happening is between the vertebral bodies, you have cartilaginous discs, and those compress over time. And so you're losing, it's not common to lose two inches, you know, from when you're in your 30s to when you're in your 70s. So you just lose a little bit between every vertebral column. Then, of course, if you've got this going on and you're not standing up straight, you're losing more height. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so normal bone on the left, osteoporotic bone on the right should be fairly obvious. In osteoporotic situations, we've got this general equation that um, bone resorption outperforms or is greater than bone deposition. So if bone resorption dominates in osteoporosis, what cell type do you think is in higher activity over the other? Osteoclastic activity dominates over osteoblastic activity. So we might try to do things to combat it to stimulate osteoblastic activity. So what are some things that you could come up with? Some very simple practical, non-drug, natural, back here, weight-bearing weight exercises. That's where this comes from. So remember in the last lecture, we talked about Wolf's Law. This is the online lecture. We talked about Wolf's Law and the remodeling of bone, right? So it, it remodels based upon the stress that it's placed under. So if you tell an elderly patient, hey, I want you to be doing some weightlifting, they're going to look at you like, are, are you serious? You know I'm like 72, right? You want me pumping iron? Well, we're not talking about, you know, put three plates on and get down and do a bench press. But, you know, if they could, if they could move the bar and do a bench press with the bar, or if they can lay down and use dumbbells, like 15-pound dumbbells or 5-pound dumbbells and work their way up, weight-bearing exercise is going to cause pressure, force vectors on the bones, causing them to remodel. Other ideas? Somebody else? Diet, calcium in your diet, maybe some supplementation, sunlight. I love how you, do you see why we actually tie the skeletal system to the skin? So sunlight, being out in the sun, getting an appropriate amount of sunlight, right? Now you don't want to burn because now you're causing UV damage, but you get an appropriate amount of sunlight. What are you stimulating the production or the synthesis of? Vitamin D, I saw you mouth it. You can say it out loud. Vitamin D, scared to say it out loud. Vitamin D, I'll say it for you. Right? Vitamin D is essential for bone health. Right? So you can get it in your diet. You can synthesize it yourself by being out in the sunlight. Right? Is it a surprise that elderly folks like to move to warm, sunny climates? Okay. So osteoporosis is a disease of the bone that leads to an increased risk in fracture. That's what we worry about. And then the statistics are poor. If an elderly patient falls, breaks a hip, ends up in the hospital for a hip replacement, there's a higher chance of infection. There's a higher chance of secondary um, infections, like lung infections. And they catch something, and, and the elderly folks are, are scared of this. Like, if I break my hip, I'm dead. That's what they'll tell you. Like, I can't break a hip, I'll die. You're not going to die from breaking the hip. You die from all the statistics that aren't good about being in the hospital with a compromised immune system, right? Because they're, they're walking around with gelatinous yellow bone marrow. Are you with me? You remember that? Okay. In osteoporosis, the bone mineral density is reduced, like in these pictures. And <clears throat> the microarchitecture is disrupted, and you can see that. We've got... The amount and the variety of non-collagenous protein in the bone is diminished and altered. So 
Osteoporosis is defined by WHO, the World Health Organization, in women, they focused on the definition in women, as a bone mineral density, 2.5 standard deviations below peak bone mass, which is a 20-year-old healthy female on average, measured by a machine, which is basically a fancy x-ray called dual absorbed geometry, DEXA. So how many of you are 20 plus or minus two in this room? Men and women. How many of you women are 20 plus or minus two? Like this is the peak. This is as good as it's going to get. <laughs> yep, it's all downhill. Not, not to scare you, but it is downhill, and I'll show you some data. There's a question over here. It's like, wow, Keller, that was a really downer of a lecture. Question, there was a question over here, or, yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, they're at risk of, higher risk of a fracture. So then the question was, if they're higher risk of fracture at the right angle or the wrong angle, however you want to describe it, are they at higher risk of paralysis if they fall wrong or fall, you know, in the right way to cause that? Well, sure. I mean, it's all statistics. So if you fall and you break, and you fall and you break, and you break a spine, right, and the spinal cord is found within the vertebral column, yeah, you have a higher risk of paralysis. But again, the number one statistic there is usually when they trip and fall, they, they, they go to their butt, right? That's your center of gravity. And as we get older, we have more gravity here. So you just fall there. You know, elder people are kind of more pear-shaped, right? So we fall and we, we fall onto the hip. And you would think like it's a padded landing, but no, I mean, if, if the bone is weak, it's, going, it's not gonna withstand the fall, the trauma. So it's most common in women, we talked about this after menopause, where we call it postmenopausal osteoporosis, but it may develop in men and occur in anyone, anyone that has particular hormonal disorders or other chronic diseases, could be a result of medication, specifically like glucocorticoids. Um, there's a lot of steroid glucocorticoids that are given as anti-inflammatories in patients that wrestle with chronic inflammatory diseases, and that actually can raise the risk of developing early onset osteoporosis. So in the U.S., nearly 10 million people have osteoporosis, and the number is growing. 18 million people have low bone mass that places them at risk for developing osteoporosis, and 80% of those with osteoporosis are women. People older than 50, one in two women and one in eight men are predict predicted to have an osteoporotic-related fracture in their lifetime. So the older you get, the more dangerous the statistics become, right? I have a friend, that, that uh, a colleague, he's 75, and he's like, I looked at the statistics yesterday. I was like, okay, about what? He's like, well, I'm 75 and I'm at a really high risk of dying now. And I said to him, I said, you know, Dr. Inslee, this is a fact, the older you get, the risk for dying goes up, <laughs> right? So he's kind of hyper-focused on this, on this concept. But yeah, that's true. In healthcare, that population of your patients in the future, if you're gonna treat elderly, they're at higher risk of all these things. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't have a young patient that is on a corticosteroid th therapy for chronic inflammatory diseases that raises their risk factors. Okay, let's talk about what we can do about it. Now that I said all the doom and gloom, let's talk about some of the therapies, treatments, ways that we can address it. And this is just one of the bone diseases. I mean, we talked about uh, achondroplasia. Remember achondroplasia in the last lecture? So tell me, what's achondroplasia? Just to review, for those of you that watched the lecture. Achondroplasia? In the back. It's, it's not necessarily a lack of chondrocytes. It translates that, but um, the chondrocytes at the growth plate don't form cartilage correctly. So that's where it gets its name from. But the patients do have 
uh, cartilage in other places. So, but yeah, a, a chondroplasia would translate as you know no chondrocytes, right? Any other details around a chondroplasia? Yeah, the, long bones of the, extremities. the long bones of the extremities don't don't grow, don't grow properly. What's the issue? Where's the issue? It's impaired cartilage growth at the growth plate. That's where we get the terminology of lack of chondrocyte function, right? A chondroplasia. Back here. It's the hyaline cartilage of the growth plate. That's right. It causes the dwarfism disease. That's right. A chondroplastic dwarfism. Okay? That's the, that's the medical term for it. So we talked about that disease. We, we talked about a couple of others. Now we're focused on osteoporosis because this is one that you'll probably deal with if you're in healthcare. We have an aging population. So estrogens, we can do estrogen replacement. Believe it or not, it works really well. It helps to slow or stop bone loss. You can take it orally or transdermally. We have the ability to deliver estrogen or you can actually modify the receptor to make them more sensitive. Those are selective estrogen receptor modulators. So estrogen is a drug, a hormone, has to bind to its receptor. You could actually upregulate the receptor to be more sensitive to the estrogen that's available. Those are SERMs. Some patients do not respond well to estrogen replacement. Makes women nauseous. Um, it, they, don't like, they don't like the way that their body feels. Um, trying to dial in the amount of estrogen that works for that patient can be a little experimental. Um, you know, some women, just like they wrestle with um, uh, the pill, uh, you know, birth control, they can't, they, can't, it, they can't handle it. Their body just doesn't work with it. Um, you see that same situation here. So it doesn't always work. Selective estrogen receptor modulators kind of came about because of that phenomenon. Uh, tends to be a little better uh, for patients, but again, there's no one magic fix, fix all. Calcium and vitamin D, we talked about that already. As a supplement, increase the amount of calcium in your diet as well as vitamin D, either through sunlight or supplementation through uh, your nutrition. Bisphosphonates, like uh, Merck made a product known as Beneva. This is actually helping to bolster or boost up the matrix of bone so that it stays and keeps its density. Uh, calcitonin, this is a hormone, um, calcitonin, that we talked about in the last lecture that helps to increase the deposition of calcium in the bones, right? And so this source of my calcin is extract, extracted from a salmon fish and utilized in a pharmaceutical medication. So again, lots of options. Exercise is not listed. We talked about that. You can put that on there weight-bearing activities. These are all ways to treat. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting in the future uh, of medicine is really uh, looking at ways to regenerate tissues. So Medtronic years ago, this was a while ago, this is probably 10, 15 years ago, created a implant that had um, growth factors associated with it known as recombinant bone morphogenic protein. So this is RHBMP2. This is recombinant. That's what the RH stands for. That's what's synthetically generated in the lab. Bone morphogenic protein, just like the word would sound, it actually stimulates bone growth. They actually coded their um, cage lumbar devices for back surgery. Um, and you can put these types of materials around different types of appliances. You break a hip, this is an artificial hip. This part right here goes into the top of the femur. Usually the, the head of the femur is sawed off and then the top is drilled out. This is inserted down into the medullary space. This is your new femoral head. And 
you know, you can kind of appreciate the socket. Uh, oh, actually, no, this is a cross section of this. So this is a uh, titanium stem, and then you've got a cement around it, and then the bone that actually forms around that. And if you coat it with a BMP growth factor, you'll get incorporation really nicely. So that's where medicine is headed, is looking at ways to use biologics, uh, regenerative technologies. You've seen some of those like in, in the skin lecture. We talked about you know, the skin gun. We talked about the old, old technology of dermograft. And what were those cells that we, we used back then? Dermal fibroblasts from? Yes, let's say it. Come on. This is the class where you can say really fun words. Where were the dermal fibroblasts from? Foreskin. Foreskin, that's right. Foreskin from the tip of the penis. That's right. Love it. Okay, so lots of new technology that you all will get to utilize as you kind of live out your clinical um, future. So on that theme, let's talk about this. So this came from a friend of mine years ago, an orthopedist um, who's now retired, but he gave me this case study. Um, clinical presentation, MG initials. Independent 78-year-old woman who fell on the dance floor at her daughter's wedding, which I feel like that's awesome, right? She was unable to walk. This part's not awesome. Complained of moderate pain about her left growing thigh. Examination in the ED revealed good range of motion of the left hip. Although it was painful, no deformity was noted. So this is what you are reading about this particular case. This is an image of MG. And if you remember back here, we said, wait a second, she fell on the dance floor and she complained of moderate pain about her left growing. Right? So this is an AP image, anatomical position. What side is the le patient's left? Your right, correct? You, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so this is an x-ray radiograph. This is the side that hurts. What the frick is over here? That was the last wedding, I think, <laughs> or bar mitzvah or whatever, okay? This is the left side, so we're going to focus on the left side. I'm kind of highlighting the uh, fracture on these red arrows, trochanteric fracture, higher view. You can hopefully appreciate it. Looks a, it see, it kind of shows up a little better on the side screens. Then the main screen, I mean, maybe you can see that gap. You see that little gap right there, that black space between the white? So this is what we're dealing with here. So uh, trochanteric fracture, another appliance that MG has. I'm pretty sure it's not going to slow her down. Uh, they, they kept the same femoral head, so she's not going to have, you know, bilateral hip replacement. She's going to have this appliance where they actually you know, kind of utilize what they have in place because it wasn't a full fracture from the lateral view. So here's the question that I have for all of you. So group up, group huddle. Patient's currently on aspirin and Coumadin, has high blood pressure. What type of gait issues do you expect this patient's going to experience, like immediately post-surgery, maybe three months, six months, one year out? Talk about those. What type of dietary suggestions would you have? You have any exercise recommendations for this patient? You want her running day two after the surgery? What do you want her to do three months, six months, a year out? Make sense? Okay, huddle up, talk about it, and I want to hear some answers here in a few minutes.
The patient didn't necessarily have surgery for osteoporosis, but at 78 years of age, do you think she's still having periods every month? No. So she was probably menopause, let's say she was late, like 55, but she's like 23 years postmenopausal, right? So what do you think's going on with her bones? Yeah, for sure. Right. Make sense? Okay. Okay. Coumadin, uh, it's a anticoagulant. Yeah, so they don't clot. Does that make sense? Old people are on it a lot. Older patients. It's like an aspirin, but like a prescription based. Yeah, I don't love the word blood thinning because it doesn't really make it thicker, thinner, but it prevents like clots from forming. So you you lower the risk of a heart attack or a stroke. That's why you put patients on Coumadin or blood thinners. That's why patients are on aspirin, like an aspirin a day. Older patients will take that because it actually s prevents it from clotting, the blood from clotting. I'll talk about that, but it's a great question. Okay. So synthesizing some information here. That's what I'm, that's what I'm after. Right? I, I, I mean, my, my number one goal is not to like, give you five exams so I can test you. Right? My number one goal is you walk out of this semester and you're like, hey, I think I learned some stuff. I'm kind of excited about what I'm going to do next, right? <clears throat> so let's synthesize some of this information. Anybody want to share thoughts from your group? We'll start here. I think starting with the first point and like having this the residualized one is free. Like I think yeah, hang on one second. You know, let's do this. This is like a this is like a talk show right now. This is like a talk show. Welcome to my TED talk. Yeah. Well, and also balance after surgery is probably not going to be so great, you know. I mean, my, my dog had surgery, had a cone, and was like running and everything. So, um, you know, after a major surgery, it takes you a little while to kind of kind of get back to normal, right? I love it. Anything else? Other group? You, you have something? Do you want the microphone? Maybe. Not really, but, but you will. Lower cholesterol. Why lower cholesterol? Uh, so like, um, reduce, reduce her high blood pressure. Maybe keep her from having a stroke or a heart attack. That would be good because she wants to dance again, right? I'm sure she's going to have more weddings. But that was her daughter's wedding. So what about the grandkids, right? Yeah, yeah, maybe MG going to stay off the dance floor for a few months, right? Probably not going to be dancing for maybe six months. Aquatic therapy is a great suggestion after the primary wounds have healed, the surgical wounds have healed. Get doctor clearance probably for bathing uh, first and, and then getting into a swimming pool, especially like a public pool. Like that, everything has to be really clean. Like the surgical site has to be totally closed. Okay, I love this. Um, what kind of gait issues do you expect? Or, 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 you know, just answer anything you want back there. You can answer whatever question you want. Yeah, so how'd you know about Coumadin? I just looked it up. You guys just Googled it? I love it. That was honesty right there. Yeah, but I mean, that's the future, right? If you don't know something, you're going to walk out of the room, say, hey, I got to go talk to my colleague real quick, Dr. Google, come back and say, hey, because you're on Coumadin, right, you did a great job. I know you're all nervous. You guys did great. So what about diet? So if she's on aspirin and Coumadin, it's a high likelihood the surgeon is going to stop those drugs before surgery for a period of time. And then 
taper them back on after surgery. Okay, because you don't want to have surgery on a patient that can't clot their blood. Like, they'll bleed out. Does that make sense? So, so that's not a trick question, but it's something that you should be aware of. Like, hey, are you still taking this Coumadin, or did the surgeon ask you to stop this before surgery, and when did, they, when did he or she say you could, you could pick it back up? If they're on aspirin and Coumadin, so dietary suggestions. I want to hear about this, but I'm going to tell you one thing. So green leafies like spinach have a lot of um, anti, natural anticoagulant capabilities, and so you, you might want to pause a little bit of the green leafies. Yes. Right, more meat and potatoes after hip surgery for a period of time because you know you don't want to like triple dip on anticoagulants. But what other dietary suggestions would you have for MG? What she should be eating other than no salt, uh, stay away from cholesterols. What what should she have? You guys don't like the microphone, huh? It's scary. I agree. So ex like extra calcium in the diet, you know, milk, dairy, you know, of course, if they can handle it. Mimosas, they should have lots of mimosas, right? No, that was a joke. Don't write that down. <laughs> Anything else to add? Pretty interesting concept of synthesizing a lot of this information. We're talking about, I mean, it's kind of the skin and the skeletal system all kind of coming into one here. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about this study. Which again, this is another study. I like to like pepper in some of these studies. This is an older study by uh, Langer and Bacani in 2000. It was like 23, 24 years old now. Um, this study actually was in uh, rodents. And they were developing a carrier, a hydroxyapatite cal tricalcium phosphate scaffolding. And they wanted to see if it could be impregnated with mesenchymal stem cells and fill a bone defect more quickly. And so that's exactly what they did, is they actually cut, here's the empty defect on the far right, they cut out the defect in 16 weeks. You can appreciate that the growth back, right here on the upper right, you see the black hole that's missing. Right? So bone is going to light up in this white color in the, the void space in the upper right. Do you see how that void space is getting smaller and smaller as time goes on? Make sense? If you look at your cell-free hydroxyapatite, just the scaffold only, not nearly as dense after 16 weeks on one that you infused or impregnated with mesenchymal stem cells. So this is stem cell therapy in 2000. Pretty groundbreaking stuff. These two dudes were like the father of tissue engineering, by the way. Their technology is what actually founded that dermograph technology that spun out of MIT. One of them's a surgeon, one of them's a scientist, one was at Mass General, the other one at MIT. They got together, big things happened. So let's talk now <clears throat> in the last moments uh, of lecture, like in the last 30 minutes, I don't think it's gonna take us that long. But as we wrap up today, let's talk more about some bone health issues. So what diseases do people worry about getting with respect to their bones, right? Obviously, osteoporosis, especially as we age. Um, <clears throat> we have other ones like osteomalacia. Uh, we have fractures. We know that those heal. Uh, rickets, we talked about those, right, in the last lecture. So bone health is kind of the interplay of a few different things. If we've got excessive bone resorption by osteoclasts, those are the cells that would be implicated here, or we could have inadequate new bone formation during remodeling, the cells that are implicated here are which ones? Osteoblasts, well done. 
The last one that we haven't talked about yet is inadequate peak bone mass. So if I said in your 20s is when your bone mass peaks, ladies, okay? This is a really important time to be thinking about your health. So bone health and calcium, not a trick question, but if you didn't know this information that we're talking about today, you might be tempted to say, well, old people, right? It's the most important for old people, prevention. But what I'm actually trying to educate is we need to be teaching these concepts to people your age or even younger so that you understand over the next decades, how do I need to pay attention to my body? Okay? So I would argue instead of 61 to 80-year-old is the most important category to be thinking about for prevention of osteoporosis, it's actually A, is the 0 to 20-year-old. So we've got a graph here that shows peak bone mass in the 20s. And then you can see at about 50 to 55 is where you've got menopause hitting. And now you have this huge drop in bone mineral content. Obviously, this graph is for women. I'll show you one for men here in a second as well. Calcium intake and age. So this is the concept is your, your storage of calcium in your bones is, is kind of like a bank account. It's like a savings account. And so where you start at your peak mass, bone mineral mass, is where you're going to decline from. Like it's, it is downhill. But if you start high enough, it's a downhill coast and it's okay. The problem is when you start too low, then you end up at high risk categories. So the idea is to educate in that zero to 20 year old range and get individuals to have peak bone mass and healthy habits with exercise, with appropriate diet selection. And as they decline, as they get older, like we all do, you stay out of that high risk category, okay? So men and women, what about men? True or false, men are not at risk of developing osteoporosis. False, false. please remember that for Monday. Okay, osteoporosis, we talk a lot about women's health with osteoporosis, and the men get left out, right? It's not as prevalent, there's no question about that, but older men in their 70s and 80s, they can have thoracic kyphotic angle, right? They can have crunched down vertebral columns, they fall and break a hip, just like an elderly woman. But the difference that's shown on this graph is, um, you know, the, the bone mass, total mass in grams on the y-axis and the age on the, on the uh, x-axis, you can see that the reason we focus so much on women in this category is because the peak bone mass never quite reaches what it is in men, on average. And that's just because the comp body composition is different between men and women. And so men have a slope, but they don't have this big drop off in menopause. And the, the loss in testosterone is a lot slower in men than it is in women, than, than the, the shut off of estrogen in women. Like menopause is abrupt and testosterone drop is actually more of a downward slope. Make sense? So <clears throat> if you were to read this graph, what's the average bone mass for men in their 80s? Can anybody tell me? Average bone mass for men in their 80s. Just reading the graph. What do you think? C, about 1,300 grams. How about another graph? <clears throat> We've got uh, males and females of different ethnicities here. So some data that you would see, ways that you might see data like this represented, because ethnic differences play a role in bone mineral density. There are ethnic differences. So average hip bone mineral density of a, of a black male at age 70, so an elderly black male. Oh, he's counting. What do you all think? 
B, okay, just under 1, so 0.98, that uh, this uh, filled in circle, this is the line that you're looking at, right? So you're looking right here at just about the age of 70, 0.98. Females, on average, do females consume enough calcium? So this is a slightly dated slide. There's no question about that. But a lot of the trends stay the same um, over time, and we haven't really made an impact. So this is why I'm saying if you look at, you know, the early years of development, like school lunch programs, uh, what kids are eating at school, what do they have in after school for snacks, after school programs, right? Um, meal programs in underserved areas where people, you know, go to get maybe one meal a day or they get, you know, dry goods and things like that. We want to make sure, especially in these young children ages, that we're filling those programs with quality foods. So hopefully what you can appreciate from this graph is the adequate intake or the amount that's needed is this dark solid line. And you can see from the age, you know, of about, you know, I guess it would be nine years of age to, you know, kind of the early 20s or the late teens, there's this huge uptick during puberty in women. And so this is the actual food and supplementation line that, that's happening. And so most of our population in females in this adolescent years or during puberty is way below where it needs to be. So where are they starting on this curve? Are we, are we advocating for them starting up here? Or unfortunately, are too many of them starting down here? Make sense? And we're just going to be seeing problems later in life when they're 50 plus years of age. So how much calcium does the uh, recommendation make or the recommended daily allowance? In teenagers and over 50, 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. Adults 20 to 49, you can drop down to about 1,000 milligrams per day. So less than 30% of the calcium you take in is actually absorbed. That's one of the problems, is you actually excrete a lot of it. So you have to pump the system pretty high. Okay. What's your favorite soda? Sprite, Dr. Pepper. Water. So G, there's a, there's a connection. Think about this through the lens, I'm asking you, and, and if you're in this class, your health choices are probably better than the average individual in this country, right? You're, you're, you're interested in this material. But look at through the lens of the last graph, the, the patient population of, you know, uh, primary school kids. How much soda are they drinking? Or energy drinks. Now it's energy drinks, right? I probably should update this. What's your favorite energy drink? You know, what is, what's the effect of taurine on bone density? I have no idea. But I w can't imagine it's helpful. Okay, so hang with me. Hang with me. Here's another study. This is off the back of a, of a Coke can. Carbonated water, sucrose, caramel coloring, phosphoric acid, natural flavors, and caffeine. Coca-Cola company, right? Phosphoric acid. Does that sound good? Phosphoric acid? Do you think that benefits the phosphate in the matrix of the bone that you have in your body? Not really. So this graph over here, these are anecdotal data. These are not directly correlated data. So you have to be careful reading some of this epidemiology. But what we have here is we've got femoral neck bone mineral density, okay? Femoral neck bone mineral density on the y-axis. And then we've got the com consumption, the number of sodas that are being consumed um, per week. So 
you're like, wait a second, per week? So seven sodas? Like, that's one a day, right? So if you look at the graph over here, this is statistically lower than those that are not consuming sodas at all. So there's a statistical drop in bone mineral density in these patients that are consuming um, a soda a day. So this was a Framingham study, which what was the name of this. This was um, published by the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And this was um, <clears throat> looking at uh, a wide population of women focused on soda consumption and then correlating it to bone mineral density. Pretty interesting, huh? So there are some, some theories that I want to brainstorm about on what's going on here. What's going on here? And that's kind of underneath this category of phosphoric acid. So one theory is that those that consume too much soda aren't necessarily consuming other drinks that would be beneficial, like, say, for example, milk. If kids are drinking soda or Monsters, they're not having milk, right? You don't, no, nobody walks to school with, like, you know, like a little carton of milk and a bendy straw, right? Like, it's, you don't see that anymore. Not like the good old days, right? Okay? Um, so that's one theory. Uh, <clears throat> Another one is cal uh, caffeine. Caffeine is actually seen, um, has been shown in the literature to impede the absorption of calcium in the gut, caffeine. So that's, that's one theory associated with this. Um, <clears throat> we had a teenager study uh, that I want to talk about. This teenager study that was done was ninth and 10th grade girls who drank soda they discovered that they had a, three, a three-fold increase in the risk of bone fractures compared to those who don't drink carbonated beverages. And it was all soda. And again, the theories being, is there a caffeine role? Is there a replacement role of having you know, not great options instead of having you know, milk as an option or even drinking water and having nutrition, you know, a piece of fruit or something like that? They're just having a soda to fill their belly. That's one of the problems with carbonated drinks. They make you feel full. So in our underserved communities, right? Hey, stay with me, folks. In the underserved communities where soda is inexpensive, vending machine foods are inexpensive, right? That fills their belly. Do you understand what I'm getting at? I mean, that's, that's where I hope many of you kind of get passionate about educating in the future. Okay, that's you know, kind of my vision of being in a classroom of 350 students, like the finger projections that can go out into the world here if you guys do stuff with this is pretty amazing. Um, now, of course, the men versus women, much of the data that we have is sex biased. It's mostly about women. Like we kind of ignore the men in this category of osteoporosis. So, we extrapolate that risk associated with men, but we don't really understand, like, what does this do in elderly men, right? So there's a huge opportunity to do a lot of research on osteoporosis in women, but also in men as well. All right, let's talk about the benefit of exercise. All right, stick with me. I know you guys are getting wiggly, and, and you see that we're almost done. The last data set that I want to I talk about and then I'll get off my soapbox. Okay, but this is stuff I'm passionate about because as an educator, like, I feel like this is how you can make a difference. Is if, I can, if I can stimulate your minds and get you passionate about making a difference, right? you have a lot more time in your career than I do. And 350 of you can do a whole lot more than I could ever do. Right? So if I can just educate you and then you take this and run with it, think about where you can go and how much of an impact we can make. So someone over here talked about weight-bearing exercises. So this is another study. This was looking at the bone mass differences in women, of course, that were racket players. So they were, it was an international study. They were tennis or squash players. And they looked at the difference between the dominant and non-dominant arms 
in these women. And they measured that difference. And so in the control group, the control group was basically non-racket playing women. They don't play tennis, they don't play squash. So the difference between their right and their left arms was minuscule. Does that make sense? Now, if they're a dominant squash player or a dominant tennis player and they're left-handed, the difference between their left and their right arm is going to be bigger. And if you look at after puberty, the difference actually was smaller. But before puberty, look at the impact of actually loading the bone. Loading the bone in these young women, I guess they're before puberty, they're young girls. After puberty, they're young women. But you load their bone with squash or tennis as a sport, a weight-bearing activity. And the dominant arm, the swinging arm, the racket arm that plays, the bone mineral density goes way up. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's more evidence that as you move on, how many of you are physical therapists to be? Or occupational therapists, physical therapists, let's raise it. Nursing? Yeah. Okay. Post-surgery, elderly populations, that weight-bearing activity is huge, hugely successful. And so many patients are like, I don't even think it's really helping. I'm going to PT, I'm not sure, you know, it's like, dude, it totally helps. All right, questions? Question was, um, in young girls, um, you know, there's a concern of if, if too much weight-bearing exercise is going to stunt their growth or make them shorter. No, I, I mean, gro growth... Growth has more to do about the epiphyseal plate and your genetics than it does about, you know, your environment and, and how, you're, how you're exercising or behaving, okay? I think there's some correlation to that in gymnastics. Yeah, but so, so, so the, the question about what about gymnasts? So if you look at, like, ballerinas and gymnasts, we got something else going on there. There's a lot of unhealthy nutritional practices, and borderline they're starving those athletes, so that they maintain a petite size, which has really nothing to do with weight-bearing exercise. It has everything to do with the nutrition side, right? Yeah. This is really important stuff, right? I mean, you know, for young boys, young girls, adolescents, and puberty, you know, kind of synthesizing a lot of information here. Okay, so the impact for building bone mineral density is a very small window. And some of you are like, you know, the 20 year old women in the room, you're like, geez, you really just like ruined my day, Keller. It's like, it's not too late. Just saying, the point is, is now is a real good time to start paying a little closer attention to this thing. Yeah. And call mom and grandma and say, hey, um, can we talk about what you're eating these days? <laughs> can we talk about you walk? I mean, walking around the block, that's a weight bearing activity. Taking walks. Why do old people walk all the time? Because it's really good for them. Okay? All right. Any other questions? I'll be done with my... Oh, yeah. So the question the question's on acromagaly. Does anybody know what acromagaly is? No? I wouldn't leave yet. You need this code. My, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm looking out for you, dude. <laughs> I know. Hey, we're, we're going to finish like 14 minutes, 10 minutes early. Uh, acromagaly. Acromagaly and uh, pituitary giganticism, right? So we don't, this is not on the exam, but since you asked. So these are issues with growth hormone. So if, if you make excessive growth hormone during childhood, right, you grow really big. And then the growth plates close. And now, if you still make a lot of growth hormone, the bones, and the, the bones have, have closed. They're not going to grow longer anymore. So you're going to get bone deformities. And we, we call that, so giganticism, pituitary giganticism is, is just really large, big people because of a lot of excessive growth hormone. Post-puberty, post-bone closure, 
if the growth hormone continues, you get deformities, and that's acromegaly. Okay? Do you guys remember an old uh, wrestler, uh, Andre the Giant? So he had pituitary giganticism, and then as he was getting older, there was some acromegaly going on because there was still growth hormone being overproduced. Okay? So athletes, athletes that take injections of steroids and growth hormone, they, they need to be very, very careful about that. All right, so that wraps up uh, the lecture. We're done, and I know you're ready to get on your way. I'm just doing the awkward pause here so I have a place to kind of pause the recording. Go ahead and get your...